Okay, so we're going to have a look at a really interesting problem to do with conditional probability, where basically if we look at the same conditional event from two different perspectives using two different coordinate systems, we'll actually get slightly different probabilities for it. So the setup is our initial sort of probability space is we're picking a point uniformly at random from this unit half disk. This is half of a unit circle, and we're including all the area in there as well. And then if we condition so that we lie on this line, so this line is either x equals 0 in Cartesian form, or it's theta equals pi over 2 in polar form. So here I've got the capital theta for the random variable representing your, the angle that your point makes with the positive x-axis. So given that we lie on this line, what is the probability that we lie in the top half of this line segment? Okay, So let's go straight into calculating this for the Cartesian form. And how are we going to do this? Because we're conditioning on a zero probability event. Got to be really careful here. What we'll do is we'll use conditional probability density function. So the probability that y is greater than a half given that x equals zero, what I can do is I can write this as the integral from a half to one of the conditional probability density function for y condition on x being equal to 0. So now the question is, what is this equal to this conditional probability density function? So this is very similar to how if you were looking at a discrete random variable, the probability y equals y given x equals x. You can write this as the probability that x equals x, so the intersection, and y equals y divided by the probability x equals x. And we can do a similar sort of thing here for the density, so it'll look very, very similar. So f, this is the conditional density of y given x equals 0. We can rewrite this as a formula in terms of the, this is the joint density function for x and y, where x is 0, y is still just equal to this variable y and then divide by the marginal density function for x. So this is where we've gotten rid of y, and we're just looking at what is the density of x at 0. So now we've still got two more things that we need to calculate. So this first one, let's have a go at this. f of x, y, what is the joint density at this point 0, y? Well, we know that we're picking a point uniformly at random, so we've got a uniform distribution on this unit half disk. So basically, if I call the region A for this half disk, your entire integral, f of x, y, we integrate this with respect to x and y, this is just going to be equal to some sort of constant. And you know that the area of this, pi r squared divided by 2, r is 1, so it's just pi divided by 2. So in order for this integrating a constant over this whole area, for this to be equal to 1, it turns out that you need f of x and y. At any point x and y has to be equal to 2 over pi. So this is so that we get, this is normalised and we get 1. And this has to be the same for every x and y because we're using a uniform distribution. Okay, so this is nice. This means now I can replace some of this up here by 2 over pi. And now there's the matter of working out what is fx of 0, this marginal. So I'll switch to another colour for this. So to work out the marginal, fx 0, basically what we need to do is we need to get rid of any sort of dependence on y. So we're interested in what is the density of x at 0 if we can separate y out from our calculation. So how we work this out is fx 0 this is the integral, so when x is equal to 0, we're here y is going between 0 and 1, so we're integrating respect to y, the joint density, where x is 0, and then y takes all these different values. Because we know that this joint density here, this is always just equal to 2 over pi, so it's the integral of 2 over pi from 0 to 1 respect to y, so this is just 2 over pi again. So that means up here now, 
I can write this as equal to 2 over pi divided by 2 over pi, which is equal to 1. OK, that's nice. And then, creating a bit of space over here, what does this actually mean for our original? What we're trying to calculate is this probability. We know that it's this integral of this function. But now we know that the conditional density for y is just equal to 1. So let me take this over here, and this becomes the integral from a half to 1, just 1 with respect to y, and then of course this is equal to just a half. So what we've shown here is that the probability that y is greater than a half given x equals 0, this is equal to 1 half. And hopefully this makes sense at some sort of intuitive level. We've got our conditional density is just equivalent to 1, because basically we've started with some sort of uniform distribution on this half disk. And we've conditioned that we lie on this line, and you would expect to have, again, some sort of uniform distribution along this line segment. And that's what we have here. The fact that the density is 1 is so that when you integrate between a half and 1, you get a probability of a half, and we've actually got a uniform distribution on this line, conditional on x equals 0. So now let's have a go at calculating the same conditional probability using polar coordinates. So we're going to take exactly the same approach as before, work out this probability as an integral using the conditional probability density function. So this is equal to the integral where r goes between a half and one, the conditional PBF for r given the future equals pi over two, integrate this with respect to r. So we're in the same position as before now where we need to work out what actually is this equal to. Well, we know that we can use the same formula as before, express this as a fraction, joint density when theta is pi over 2 and r is just equal to r, divided by the marginal density for theta at pi over 2. And as before, we're going to need to calculate each of these things. So this is where it gets quite interesting. If we have a go, first of all, let's have a look. What do we need to do for the joint density? Well, we're looking for the whole area we do the area integral, so this is r and theta with respect to r and theta. This all needs to be equal to 1. And it's very tempting at this point to say, okay, well, this just needs to be equal to a constant. But we need this to be an area integral. And at the moment, we've got dr, this is an infinitesimal measure of length, but d theta is just an infinitesimal measure of angle. So we need to actually replace d theta by r d theta here. So what this means is our integral is now going to look like the integral over this region of basically some constant times by r dr d theta. So this is like when you change variables from Cartesian to polar, you get r dr d theta from your Jacobian. So that this r d theta multiplied by your dr, this gives you an infinitesimal measure of area. So this constant, when we work this out, you know that the area of this is pi over 2, so this constant, just as before, has to be 2 over pi. And the upshot of this is we now know that 2 over pi times r, this is equal to our joint PDF for r and theta. So now we can replace this up here, can't we? So we can say this is now equal to, call it 2r over pi, divided by whatever the marginal is going to be. So now it's time to calculate the marginal PDF for theta at pi over 2. So all we need to do now is integrate. R is going between 0 and 1. We're going to integrate out the joint PDF at pi over 2 with respect to R. So we know that this whole thing, the joint PDF, is 2R over pi. So that's nice. We can just replace all of this by 2r over pi. 
and then we're left with the integral between 0 and 1, 2r over pi with respect to r, and this gives us r squared over pi evaluated at 1 minus r squared over pi evaluated at 0, which just gives us a 1 over pi. So what does that mean? Well, this means that the marginal, which we just calculated, when we integrate out r, we get 1 over pi. We've got a 1 over pi term in the denominator of this fraction. So I'll write it like this, so it's really clear. And now your 1 over pi terms cancel, and this is just equal to 2r in the end. Okay. So what we've shown then is actually this entire thing, the joint density, um, so the conditional probability density function for r given theta is pi over 2, this is just equal to 2r. So I can take this whole thing here and replace it by 2r. So now what I'm left with is a really easy integral to calculate, integral between a half and 1, 2r with respect to r. This gives me r squared evaluated between 1 and a half. So this gives me 1 minus a quarter, and this gives me 3 quarters as my conditional probability now. So this is really surprising because we've done the same calculation using Cartesian coordinates. We've got a probability a half of being in this red region, of being in the top half of this line, conditional on lying on this line. But now we've done the exact same calculation using polar coordinates and conditional on lying on this line segment the probability of being in the top half of it is 3 quarters. So this is really quite surprising. We've got what seem to be certainly the same two conditional probabilities, the same two conditional events, yet when we calculate the actual conditional probability, we get different answers. So what's gone wrong here? What's the problem? Well, it turns out we haven't made any sort of calculation errors where we've worked with finding the conditional densities and carrying out the integrals. But the issue here is actually this assumption, this idea that these two are the same event, because they're not quite the same thing. And if we have a look at this geometrically, see what's going on kind of behind the scenes of the integral of the conditional PDF, this should become a little bit clearer. So when we've done the calculation in the Cartesian form, this is basically the same as taking limits as epsilon goes to zero of x being in a small region around zero. So this is the same as the limit, the probability y is greater than a half given x is between negative and positive epsilon. And if I were to draw this out, what does this look like? So essentially we're saying we're in a very thin strip like this of width 2 epsilon, and then we take limits as this strip gets thinner and thinner, and this gives us our limiting conditional probability of y being greater than a half. Whereas if we look at the polar coordinates, what's going on in the background behind the integral with the conditional probability density function here? So again, it's similar, we're taking limits as epsilon goes to zero, probability r is greater than a half, given that theta is in a region within epsilon of pi over 2. So it's in this interval between pi over 2 minus epsilon and pi over 2 plus epsilon. And what does this look like geometrically? This is a slightly different picture to before. So now we're in a very thin segment, uh, a very thin sector, and we're taking limits as the angle of this sector gets smaller and smaller as epsilon goes to zero. And if you ever think about, this is basically almost a rectangle, there's a small curvy contribution at the top that means that your probability of being in the top half is ever so slightly different to being in the bottom half. But as you take limits it gets to look more and more rectangular. However with this one, it's going to look more and more like a triangle. And if I draw this out, Hopefully this makes it a little bit clear that the probability of being in the bottom half got one of these four triangles, so these are all the same size. Your probability of being in the bottom half is only a quarter, and your probability of being in the top half is three quarters. So as we're taking limits, the probability of being in the top half is always around three quarters 
in the polar case, whereas in this case it looks more like a rectangle with a slightly curved contribution there, but as we take limits this gets thinner and thinner, it looks a lot more like a half and a half. So what's going on behind this sort of change from using the conditional probability density function for each is the geometric picture is actually very different for the two because we've got the two different coordinate systems. So here you're going to get a probability of half, here you're going to get a probability of three quarters being in the top half of this line. There's actually no reason why we couldn't take limits in another way as well. So you could, for example, take limits using a triangle like this and make the width of the base smaller and smaller until eventually you're approximating the probability of being on this line here. And if you take limits in this way, hopefully you can see this is basically the same picture as this but upside down, and now you get a probability a quarter of being in the top half and a probability three quarters of being in the bottom half. So depending how you take limits here, you can get completely different answers here. So the sort of an important take home message from this is that if you're calculating a conditional probability, conditioning on some sort of zero probability event, at some point you've got to take limits. And depending how you take limits, you get a different answer, you get a different conditional probability. So there is no one conditional probability of being in the top half of this line, given that you lie on this line, because it depends on the limiting process you use to get there.